was kind of our backyard. So, you know, kids have jungle gyms. We had Rocky Point. When you pull up and you saw that Rocky Point sign when you first pulled up, your heart started pumping. It was always an adventure. For us as kids, it was just that great place to go, that great escape, that almost like you were going to Oz, because at the time when it first started, it was just, it was Disney to us. It was just an amazing place. And I think anybody that was at Rocky Point in those days would agree that it was probably the most fun place you could go to. There's something about Rocky Point that has a certain nostalgia and flavor that's really hard to, I think, recreate today. The story goes up to that ride. Even though I crouched down next to the sign that read, you must be this tall. In the summer, there would be long, 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 long lines of cars coming down Rocky Point Road. We start screaming when we saw the sign, Rocky Point. Hey, you got to turn here. You got to turn here. We enjoyed going to Rocky Point, especially on Wednesdays because it was half price. It was on the bay. It was on the water. You got that cool breeze. You had that salt air, and and it, it was almost being in another world. It was the shining star of Rhode Island. The Ferris wheel, the flume, all of those things were just a part of the average Rhode Islander's summertime. You must be this tall. 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 Before Rocky Point was an active park, it was a beautiful piece of land with ledges and caves and bushes and incredible views of the water. And it was owned by uh, Thomas Stafford Jr. and his wife Polly. In the 1840s, a sea captain named William Winslow used to take his boat down the river so that uh, his passengers could see the scenery. And he, he saw Rocky Point, you know, and decided that would be a heck of a good place to have a uh, Sunday school picnic. And within a few years, he began taking more and more groups down there and decided that uh, it'd be a good idea if he leased it, and then eventually he bought it. It was at that point that um, he started putting different small amusements on the property and bringing people there for the sole purpose of having picnics and, and just enjoying the land. the clam house and a bakehouse and his wife that whom they referred to as Mother Winslow, you know, she would set up and would have the big uh, clam bake. In 1865, Winslow sold the property to Byron Sprague for $60,000. Um, Sprague built a 10-floor observatory in the park, standing 250 feet above sea level. He built the hotel overlooking the landing area, which had three stories and 300 rooms, its own boathouse and its own stable. He also built a three-story mansion house next to the hotel for him to live in. And he envisioned this as being a very exclusive, rich man's playground. You're going to add a golf course, you know, and a steamship would come in and there would be places, you know, for people to stay over and everything else. But after about five years, uh, it didn't work out too well. Uh, he lost an awful lot, so he sold out to the steamship company. 
and they built it up. They made $200,000 worth of additions to the park. They got the shooting gallery going. They brought in trapeze artists and musicians, performing animals. Um, before long, people from all over the country were coming to Rhode Island just for the sole purpose of going to Rocky Point. Rutherford Hayes visited Rocky Point on June the 28th, 1877. Rutherford Hayes and his party came to the pier and gave a few brief remarks and then proceeded to a clam bake where over 1,500 people were fed thousands of clams. At some point along the way, President Hayes went into the hotel and was linked up on a telephone with Alexander Graham Bell who was 13 miles away in Providence, Rhode Island at another hotel. Mr. President, I am speaking with you through 13 miles of wire without the use of galvanic current on the line. I hope that you understand distinctly what I say and I shall be very glad to hear something from you in reply to this if you please. Well, President Hayes was then asked to say something and his response was not the most memorable. It was, please speak a little more slowly. So those are the first words ever said by a president on a telephone. Randall Augustus Harrington was born in Warwick in 1854. He was um, a theatrical manager, very involved in entertainment promotions of every kind. He um, became the park manager, the manager of Rocky Point, and put a lot of money into um, the more modern type of, of rides. He had tremendous imagination. He put in the carousels, and he had this big toboggan where you slid down and you went right into the water. People, you know, really loved that. And he also took advantage of the uh, new, well, at that time, fairly new fad of baseball, you know, really was catching on. By 18, uh, mid-1860s to 1870, every town, every nook and cranny, every little crossroads in Rhode Island had their own baseball team. Rocky Point, as far as I can tell, was the only place in New England in the 1890s and the early 1900s uh, that professional ball players could, uh, could stage a game on Sunday. The uh, proprietor of Rocky Point, Randall Harrington, uh, had connections with you know, many of the powerful politicians in Rhode Island that implicitly supported uh, all these basically illegal activities. At that point, you can't open up a daily newspaper without seeing mention of baseball at Rocky Point. Mm -hmm. 
Babe Ruth actually was signed originally by the Red Sox and played two games in 1914 up in Boston before he was being, before in essence he was shipped down to Providence Grays where he finished out the season going eight and one as a pitcher and it led them to the pennant uh, championship that year. And uh, one of the more interesting stories around Babe Ruth is involvement in Rhode Island happened at Rocky Point. Babe Ruth hit a, a very famous home run there in uh, 1914. And as it turns out, there was a, there was a ground rule. So even though uh, he uh, circled the bases, there was a ground rule that said he was only entitled to a triple. So he, uh, you know, uh, technically uh, in the box score, he's, uh, he's down for, for a three base hit. But uh, uh, you read the accounts and certainly the legend of it is that he hit a home run into the ocean. In 1900, another big change came, was when they electrified the Warwick Railroad. When they electrified the Warwick Railroad, they put in a loop that went right to Rocky Point. And this was fantastic. In the summertime, they, there was such a demand for people to go to Rocky Point that cars ran from Providence every five minutes. And they would come down open cars. You know, it was a great time. It was a, a wonderful period uh, for them. And that really um, created a a tremendous opportunity for the average person to come down from Providence. But well, we would get on the trolley car all the way from Providence to Rocky Point, and we'd get a ride back, but it was a terrific ride, and we enjoyed it. That was a, a wonderful experience. I don't know if you've ever seen an open trolley. It was terrific. No sides. No sides. In the summertime, they used them just to go to Rocky Point. In 1919, Colonel Harrington uh, had died and his wife and son had no interest in uh, continuing to run the park. So my two great uncles, Alfred and Paul, took over the running of the park in uh, 1919. Uh, and they uh, ran it until it was destroyed in 1938. Well, the problem with the 38 hurricane is, you know, back then weather technology was, was pretty much nil. So it's one of those storms that uh, came without warning, it came by surprise, and it was a, you know, a very large, very powerful storm. The hurricane of 1938 was a major hurricane, what we refer to as a Category 3 storm. It was a storm that had winds sustained over 120 miles per hour and gusts over 150 miles per hour. That is a lot of wind. So these structures back then in 1938 uh, could not withstand that kind of wind. It was just, it destroyed a lot of things. You know, perhaps today the corkscrew, that huge steel structure would have done a lot better in the 38 hurricane than some of the rides and, and buildings back then. Rocky Point, the location of the park itself, is actually very vulnerable to all kinds of weather, uh, water and wind. Very shallow bathymetry in Narragansett Bay, that just means the water is pretty shallow for a very long distance, allows the storm surge from a hurricane or even a nor'easter to just develop in the bay and run pretty much right up onto the coast and into the park. And just tremendous. I mean, it's the kind of storm that ranks up there with almost like a, a Katrina of today. I mean, the storm surge, uh, flooding, tremendous wind. It did a, an incredible amount of damage. I mean, Narragansett Bay, and especially communities like Warwick and Comimicate Point and the Rocky Point were essentially ground zero. It was the absolute worst place to be uh, during that storm. Rocky Point used to have a monkey pit, and I guess during the 38 hurricane, the monkeys got out. At least some of them got out. We don't know how many actually got out of there alive, but they made their home in the woods along Rocky Point Road. I looked and I saw a monkey uh, in the trees, and this was in uh, this was in November or December of 19. 
40 or 41. And uh, so the monkeys had escaped, and they had uh, evidently survived for a number of years. And uh, so there was quite a, uh, quite a do about the, the monkeys. Oh, they had a great time, and, and people just loved it and went and fed them. And of course, that just kept them there all the longer. But it got to be quite a, an attraction for people to go there and <laughs> to see the monkeys. <laughs> Yeah, 16 years later, we get, uh, we get Hurricane Carol. It's a, it's a pretty significant storm. It's not quite as bad as the 38 storm, but it's, it's still pretty bad. Uh, unlike the 38 storm, it, it doesn't come by surprise. There is some warning, so there's actually time to prepare as far as protecting life and property, unlike in 1938. But even with that storm, an incredible storm surge, in other words, a rapid rise of water in Narragansett Bay, so more flooding, still with winds of 100 miles per hour. And it was really the last major storm to hit the area. We've yet, even today, to see a, a Category uh, 3 hurricane. two men, I think, that were starting to rebuild the park. They ran out of money, and they sent their accountant to see my father, and my father lent them the money, and uh, he, he went to the park to see what was going on, and he said, it isn't going to work this way. And uh, he took the place over and started from there and built, uh, built everything. My father, Vincent, uh, brought his two brothers over from Italy, uh, Conrad and uh, John. Conrad was the uh, manager of the uh, Shaw Dinner Hall, and John was the manager of the Midway. But I think by 54, Vincent Furla, you know, owned the park. And it had, uh, again, people said, oh, that's it, Rocky Point is dead, you know. But within a few years, they built it up again, and when they did, and they had the opening day, I can't remember the exact date, but when they had the opening day, they had so many people come, but coming to Rocky Point. This time, of course, every, you know, there were a lot of automobiles, that they had a massive traffic jam all the way from, you know, pretty much Rocky Point up Route 1 to Cranston. You know, it was unbelievable. So many people came, which showed without a doubt that Rocky Point not only wasn't dead, but it was still a New England's favorite attraction. <laughs>
Uh, my name is John Gould. Um, I worked here from 1969 to 1983. Uh, ride operator, supervisor, carpenter. It's really, really bad And we're standing here just inside gate one, right where, right in front of where the, where the old clip house was in the office. Ready to go down to the midway. What's left of it. This is the Castle of Terror. This was it's a great fun ride. Ran this, my buddy Frank Cook. Frank Cook and I, one summer, we had this thing down to a science. We would run this thing like it was a, like a production. So you sat on a chair, left foot operated turnstile. Right foot operated the safety lap, lap bar. Right hand grabbed the lap bar, opened it for the people, let them in, dropped it in. Right, left hand pushed one of three buttons, controlling the cars, moving them up here. And at the other end, the guy was just opening it all up and making sure the people would exit. And we do this half hour at a time, half hour up here, then a half hour down there, half hour back and forth. But yeah, just in the middle of the night one night, I'm just, woke up, it was freaky. House of Horrors was uh, the talk of Rhode Island, really. I mean, it actually was, well, more, more so the Castle of Terror, you know? I mean, um, and every time I went there, it was always a long line. <laughs> they had the House of Horrors or whatever it was, but I've been in many of those since then. It was the Castle of Terror. When I was a kid, it was always the front looks like a castle. It really isn't a house of horrors. It's a castle of terror. That sign came from an older uh, amusement at Rocky Point called the House of Horrors, I think in the 40s or 50s. So it was a re, re, um, recycled sign. And it was always a castle of terror. It wasn't any second rate old sign jacked up ride. It will be the castle of terror forever. You, as you were waiting in line, there was this smell of grease that came from the track that I, every time I smell that to this day, I think of the House of Horrors, like, and you could hear the, the, um, the cars clinking up the track. You come up the lift hill, uh, you'd go out over the balcony, and you come in, and there was a, a, like a, a long corridor with uh, stalactites and stalagmites and so forth, and there, at the end of that corridor was a torture scene. That's where the, there was a woman that was bound to the wall, and she was breathing. She had like heaving breaths. She was breathing. There was a guy getting stretched on a rack. There was another guy hanging from the ceiling. The thing of most significance, I thought, was the Viking. Uh, the Viking was, uh, to again, toward the end of the ride. It was on the first floor, uh, maybe just before the last corridor. And it was like a long, straight approach to him. You could see him in the distance. Now, they did remove that at some point, And I can't remember what year it was. And they put him outside the building. Um, uh, spearing a dragon. I think they took his cornucopia horn away and they put the, um, the spear in his hand. He was like spearing a dragon. I get in the car, it goes around the first bend, goes through the crash doors, then jumps off the track and sticks right there at the bottom of that first lift hill. And the chains are rattling and the car's bouncing back and forth and the two of us are screaming at the top of our lungs, get me out of here. I, this is way more than the Castle of Terror we bargained for. The, I want to say the ride operator, but the kid was probably about 14 years old. S slams open the door, flicks all the lights on, and says, don't worry about it, I can't push you backwards, we're just going to have to go through with the lights on. So we held on to the little bar, we're going through, and actually, I have to tell you, it was probably the best ride on the Castle of Terror, because all the lights were on, we got to see all the bugs, all the motors, all the things that made the Castle of Terror work. Every summer, we knew of the pool, and my brother, my middle brother and I were swimmers, and I was a good swimmer. And uh, so my mother would allow us to, well, she bought us a pass 
two passes for the pool. In those days, you had to buy a pass. And every day during the summer, Charlie and I uh, would go down and swim. Our first stop, of course, was the uh, Olympic swimming pool. And I uh, had, you know, filtered salt water, had three diving boards, uh, and a deep pot had 12 foot deep water, had two slides. We always had a great time every time we went there. I felt excitement when I entered Rocky Point Park, especially when I saw the, um, the in-ground swimming pool. That was a lot of fun, being in that pool, being with my friends, riding my bike to Rocky Point, spending the day near the pool. You didn't even have to go into the park and go on any of the rides if you didn't want to. The pool was enough for the whole day. This was like an all-day thing for us. We wouldn't get, we wouldn't get out of there till dusk. And then, we'd, I mean, this was an all-day thing at the pool. So much fun, and, uh, you know, just getting up there and diving off, or in my case, jumping or just going down like this and just falling off, and then into that deep pit. I didn't dive off the diving board, but I loved to go to jump off the diving board because they had this, the center of the pool was about 12 feet deep, so you could really dive. The swimming pool, you know, it was the best and the worst at Rocky Point because it was a saltwater swimming pool. You know, it was salty water. It wasn't, it wasn't the beach. It still had concrete. It was a weird pool. area there was this boy he was older than me at the time and um, his name was Billy Ross and he and his brother climbed the fence and fell onto this electrical system and he just got burned and when they called the fire department his father was the man who found him his son and the other boy, I think it was Bobby, his, his brother Bobby was with him, and he was screaming and crying, uh, watching his brother being burned. And he lost both arms. And he would climb the, the stairs to the highest uh, diving board and just dive off like nothing, you know, like it was so natural to him. And I know I used to be amazed at him, and. He would just dive off and swim like a fish. And um, I was just in awe of him. He was a champion uh, swimmer and diver. You should have seen this kid dive. He wouldn't wear his gear, so there were these little stubs. And he would go off to the third, he'd start around playing off of the, uh, the first and second, but then he'd get up on that third board and just do miraculous things for a kid who was the way he was. He was wondering how good he could be if he had arms. It was amazing how he kept his balance. He'd do the flips, backward flips. So he'd get up there and everybody was like, oh. And you were a little kid, that would like freak you out. And then he's up on the highest board and he was a great diver. He used to like blow our minds. Strong swimmer, incredibly fast. And uh, everyone, of course, knew who he was and everybody watched him. And he sort of like showed off because he was good. You know, everything he did was really good. I, I, rem I remember the kids were kind of like afraid of him because the adults would say, uh, he's the electric boy. And yeah. he lost his arms by crawling up uh, telephone poles and uh, cr climbing on the wires and all this kind of silly stuff. And uh, we'd believe it. So we didn't want to get too close because we were afraid he'd, we might get electrocuted if we touched him. Um, was was a burden to the economy of the park. It was a direct expense. It produced very little income, and it was um, much more costly to operate and maintain it than anything that it produced. Uh, 
also because it was a, a, a much older facility, uh, it was coming to a point where it would have needed massive renovation and uh, very costly upgrades and equipment. Also, the bathhouse um, would have had to be totally renovated. So just strictly on a numbers decision, um, it was just decided that the, the pool was no longer productive and had to be closed. Well, I knew what to do. I knew I had to impress you. I could see it in your eyes that you had your heart set on that prize. But this game ain't for children. Pay attention. You need to listen. It's a guaranteed sell. You'll be pleased. Want to swing that hammer? 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 You'll be pleased. I can ring that. I worked at um, High Striker, I remember a lot, which I didn't like, and it was, it was a little fixed, I think, like it was the, where you would hit, you know, like a strong man thing and it would shoot up and I know that it was um, something with the computer, if too many people were getting it, you know, high scores, it would make it more difficult to get. Bowl Over the Bottle was a game that we came up with uh, that did very well uh, money-wise. And it was a very simple game because all you did was try to knock over two Coke bottles. Uh, people loved it for some reason. I don't even know what the reason was, but I think it was uh, had a lot to do with the merchandise that, that we uh, used for it. And one of the games they had back in the olden days was a ping pong ball toss. And there would be little fish bowls. And if you managed to get the ball in the fish bowl, you'd win the goldfish. Well, Labor Day weekend of 1967, one of the members of my family won the goldfish. And we had that goldfish, we called Goldie, until 1979. And so to have a goldfish live for 12 years out of a little ping pong ball toss was quite an experience. Remember the little fish we won? The Rocky, we called them Rocky. How can you remember? It was a little thing, well, it was a tragic <laughs> thing. Mom flushed them down the toilet one day. <laughs> one of them was down the garbage disposal. Right. And uh, I don't know what it was. The fish was dead, though. It, it, we don't want to get in trouble. The clown, the where, yeah, the balloon race, where the clown would blow up a balloon and you'd shoot the water into the target. And that was always fun, hearing balloons pop all day. And then um, just the different things where people would throw the balls in the trash cans. and. Uh, uh, cat rack where it had the wooden cats and people would throw balls and knock over the cats. The cats, the, that was a real popular game, especially on Friday nights. And everybody wanted to try to knock over a cat. They had this one game where they had all the strings 
and at the end of the string, you had all the, the guy holding all these strings together, and at the other end of the string were all these toys, and you get to pull one string, you know, I think it was maybe a quarter or three for a quarter or something, you pull a string, it pulls up something, and that's what you win. I always, I used to see these people walking around the midway with these giant stuffed panda bears, giant stuffed animals, and I always wanted to win one, but I never did. There was a number of versions of ring toss. Uh, the one we had at Rocky Point was a small ring, a plastic ring, and you tried to get that on top of a 64-ounce uh, bottle. And that was also a very popular game. Ski ball is uh, at least 100 years old, and it's uh, a staple in every amusement park. The, the most popular game was break a dish. And uh, basically, you took you had dishes about yay big. They were they were real. They were about probably the cheapest dishes you could get. We used to get crates of them in the back, right? And you put them up, and uh, there was it was wood. You put them up together. There'd be a gap like that, and you'd have to you got a baseball, and you had to break two dishes with one baseball. So you had to get between, and there was about a gap like that. And you could do it. There was nothing special about those dishes. My uncle told us to stay away from them because they were fixed. <laughs> they were rigged. He said, don't, don't waste your money on them. All the games at Rocky Point were skill games. Uh, there was really no trick. We've got amusement park fun in the Rhode Island sun. Come on down to Rocky Point. Our chowder crates are frantic too. The best and fun and games for you. We also had Hugo Zucchini, the human projectile. Most people call that a human cannonball, but Hugo preferred human projectile, and we would set him up uh, on the midway area between the flume and the skyliner, and he'd have his net set up at the far end, and he would climb in the cannon, and they would raise the cannon up, and Hugo's assistant would yell, you ready, Hugo? Three, two, one, and Zucchini's off! And it was kind of a unique building in that it was built on the side of a hill. So from one side of the building, it was like three stories high, and from the main entrance, it was only one story. So the main short dinner hall, you came in from the front of the building, and it was just a huge open space. Well, there's a place you go to gather around, a place where they cook the clam cakes by the pound. Clam cakes and chowder, clam cakes and chowder, clam cakes and chowder, they taste so good to me. Well, an ice cold pop, a slice of watermelon, corn in the cob, and my mama yelling for the clam cakes and chowder. Clam cakes and chowder. Clam cakes and chowder. It tastes so good to me. Yeah! And I, I couldn't believe the size of the hall, because if I went and there's maybe five sets of, five rows of people eating, you look around and there's like a hundred rows, and you say, how can this place be full sometimes? But I guess at one, at one point it was, you know, for different events. Well, you spend all day. In the park, you gotta hit the hall before it gets dark for the clam cakes and chowder. Clam cakes and chowder. Clam cakes and chowder. A taste so good to me. Well, an ice cold pop, slice of watermelon, corn in the cob, and my mama yelling for clam cakes and chowder. Clam cakes and chowder. Clam cakes and chowder. A taste so good to me. Yeah, let's go get it. They had these young, long tables that probably sat, I'm going to say they shot, sat 50 or 60 people. Big, long tables. They were, were probably a series of smaller tables, but they made a big, long table. So you came in, and if there were three people, they sat you at the table. And then two more people came in, they sat you next to them. And You just, you didn't pick a place. You just filled in the next seats and kept going. And then as that table empty, we cleaned that one, and they just move up almost to the point where the bar was. And by that time, usually, we were able to start all over again. They had several types of of meals. You could go in and get a full short dinner or you could buy, you could go in and just get chowder and clam cakes. I think it was like three dollars and change when I was a kid and you had uh, the red clam chowder and they kept bringing you the clam cakes. They really weren't very good but you know they seemed look great at the time. They had window row which was along the window. That, that would be the, the lobster dinner, chicken maybe, fish, with the regular chowder, clam cakes, watermelon, corn, 
uh, French fries, and then the uh, regular chowder dinner was chowder clam cakes and watermelon, all you could eat. The first thing they would, they would bring out would be the clam cakes, and those would be in a kind of a big silver bowl, and they'd put X amount of those on the table, and then they'd come out and they'd bring the big terrines of chowder, which were all stainless steel buckets with, with big spoons, and they, you could eat as, this was all, all you could eat. Well, we used to be there for two or three hours sometimes, well, people that were coming after us, maybe an hour and a half later, they'd be gone, and we'd st still be eating. And they'd want to get us out of there. And uh, one or two occasions, they called the police, they told us to get out, but I said, no, you know, it's uh, supposedly all you can eat. So we're just taking a rest right now. People used to hang around just to see the busboys clean the tables, because you'd clean the tables, you all up, and then you had this big roll of paper and one guy would get at one end of this table, and the tables had to be you know, probably about 20, 25 feet long. And he'd hold one of it, and you'd just roll the roll down the table. It would just roll all the way down the other. The guy at the other end would catch it, tear it off, and go to the next table. First job was uh, at the uh, Shaw Dinner Hall. That's when I realized I definitely was going to go to college, because that was a real learning experience. And I was a busboy, and worked for one of the furloughs. I figured which one managed it. And we would just work from 10 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night, busting the tables. And it was really, really tough work. And I was called down to the uh, takeout window of the Shard Dinner Hall because an elderly woman had uh, passed out. So they wanted me to go down and uh, see if she needed first aid. And I called our first aid guy, and he met me down there. And uh, the funniest thing about it was, as we were checking this poor woman out, and it was just the heat that had gotten her, uh, Conrad Frohler rode up on his motorcycle and called me over. And I'm never going to forget this. He looked me in the eye and he said, did she eat the chowder? Probably the thing I remember most about the food at Rocky Point. Not that, you know, the clam cakes and chowder were great. It was fun. The view was wonderful. But I will always remember red chowder underneath the spider and on the walls of the Tilt-A-Whirl. Anytime I think of it, it's the second time around. And my really distinctive <laughs> memory of it was... Uh... Somebody complaining there weren't enough clams in the chowder. And the cook said, I'll give you some clams in the chowder. But uh, Rocky Point was great for concerts. You know, they had every weekend they would have a concert there. Uh, we had all different kinds of acts. It would go from country to pop to uh, heavy metal. I mean, Alice Cooper, uh, Samantha Fox, Taylor Dane, Stevie B, all top 40 acts from the late 80s to the early 90s. And one of the famous uh, rock stations in the area used to do something called T-shirt and rock night where they'd have a band in. And uh, if the first uh, 500 people that would get to the park by a certain time would receive a free T-shirt with the station logo and then the band's logo on the back and then they'd get to see the rock show for free, uh, either in the Palladium or uh, on the Midway, depending on how big the act was. They used to do um, tribute shows to the Rolling Stones and to the Beatles and have people impersonate them. Those are probably the ones that I would remember the most. I know Adam Ant played there when he was still part of Adam and the Ants, um, so probably about 30 years ago, I remember that pretty vividly. Of course, we had a tour group called the 30 Years of Rock and Roll, which came through, which had the likes of uh, Bobby Pickett and uh, Mickey Dolans from the Monkees. Uh, we also had like, Crystal Gale, many, many other artists that right now it just escapes me. There were so many. We had concerts every weekend for many years. I was chasing concerts around forever. I've been to every concert you can imagine, Hendrix and Providence. But uh, I went to see Janis Joplin at Rocky Point, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure it was 68. And uh, she was playing at the Palladium. I went with this girl from Connecticut, Betty Ann, and uh, me and her were. She was in the ladies' room, and I was waiting for her to come out. And Janis Joplin come walking out, looking wild. I think she's a lot smaller than people thought. She looked like she was about this big, actually. And uh, she asked me for a dime to make a phone call. I didn't have one. And my friend came out of the bathroom, and I said, Hey, Bet, it's Janis Joplin. She needs a dime for a phone call. And she goes, Oh, I got one. So we gave her the diamond she, she goes, thanks, honey, <laughs> makes a phone call. And we'd, I would listen to a call, uh, somebody in California, and it was pretty cool. We had this other guy jamming with us, Todd, and we were playing this outside gig on the top of a 
flatbed, flatbed truck. truck at a video store opening. And Todd just started playing the beginning of it. We all jumped in, started playing it. The crowd went absolutely nuts and the rest just kept playing history. it. Kooky. Kooky yeah. nuts. Yeah. That's they, what surprised they me. They just flipped it out. Just, it was and, just like, uh, <laughs> why, why would these people possibly respond this way to, to a, a theme song? You know, an amusement park. Come with your friends. It's a rocky point tradition. Cause it's summertime again. It was supposed to be like a log, like we were riding a log down a flume, I guess, like an old old log in, uh, you know, when they used to run the logs down a mountain or something. Uh, we needed to have two in the front, one in the back, or one in the back, one in the front. Could never have two in the back because the boat would fly right off the uh, water. Basically, you left the station and you just kind of went down this winding sort of river path that was more like a sort of like a water slide. And the, you know, as you're going going through this thing, you'd get a little wet. And there was a there was a small like hill you'd go up and you'd go down that had a small drop, and you'd get a little more wet with that. And then you kind of wound your way by the back of the park, by where the um, where the train was. People on the phone would splash everybody on the train, and the people on the train were trying to get the people to splash them. And and then you came around the back and you went up a hill. There was a chain, if I recall that grabbed it and it took you up the top of the hill. And the exciting part of the ride was when you got at the top of the hill and you went down the hill. You went down pretty fast and down the bottom, especially depending on the water level, they could adjust the water level up and down. When you got down the bottom, it, there was a big splash. Some logs I still think were heavier than other logs because it seemed like the certain, certain number of logs you'd get wetter. This guy and girl got on boyfriend girlfriend and they were in the front there and uh, the guy was here and the girl was here and they were coming down the bottom of the hill and that steep hill and they come to the bottom and get wet. Well, he took and pulled her top up and when he did, the water took the top right off of her and she got up on top of the deck and she had no top and everyone was cheering and clapping and you know and she's over there top was beating the life out of them that was funny <laughs> we had to get a shirt and cover up the police came it was just a whole bunch of stuff but that was kind of cool you know everybody liked the flume because you get wet at the end you know and bring your girlfriend down and everything but i always liked the ferris wheel because when you got up top you know you could look out because it look out over the bay it was magnificent view from the top of the Ferris wheels.
to uh, get a little yarn bracelet with a little metal clip on it and that was cool because that proved that you were in for the day. You didn't just have the, the tickets that you had to rip off. So um, we get in the line and uh, we'd run in and we'd show our bracelet to the, the ride operator and we just thought that we were so cool. We'd jump on the ride, we'd go from one to another to another. Um, we would just spend the whole day there and it was great. And there was this skydiver sitting in the middle of the midway, brand new ride that year. And this thing was 70 feet tall. It was terrifying just to look at it. Later on that day, it starts spinning around. We thought we'd go on it, but the closer we get, those cars are going upside down. People are at the top hanging, screaming. There's no way we're going on this at this point. We walk by again. Finally, we, we say, you know what? We've been on every ride in this park. We're going on the skydiver. We go up and we ask the guy, hey, do we have to go upside down? We notice that some people are and some people aren't. He said, no, there's a steering wheel right in the car. Get in, just hold the wheel, and you, can, you don't have to go upside down. So the wheel starts. He brings down the top, actually, locks us in. We reach out for the steering wheel, and our little 10-year-old arms don't reach the steering wheel. He starts the ride. We are like, picture two rag dolls in a clothes dryer, banging around feet, knees, everywhere. It was a horror show. I used to like the Dodgems. I don't know if you remember what they, they were, but they had they were little cars, and you could and they were they had a big long stem that went up to the roof, and I guess that was how it was powered through electricity, and you could uh, they had these big rubber you know uh, bumpers, and they were kind of bumper cars that, that you would call them, and you you just get on one side of this big uh, big uh, uh, area. And uh, you go with your buddy, who was uh, maybe were 10 or 11 years old, and he got the greatest kick out of uh, staging head-on collisions. You know, that was, a, uh, that was a wonderful uh, experience for all of us. And of course, there was a sign that said you weren't supposed to bump people, but, you know, that was how they, you know, everybody whacked each other. I mean, unless you saw somebody with a small child. But when we went on it, we would just whack each other to death, because, you know, we, that was fun. One night I was there, it was a rainy night, we think we closed and some kids came on to ride the ride. And I said, ah, we'll run them. And I ran them, and they had just put the fence up around the ride. So uh, the car got stuck, I said to the kid that was with me, he was a brand new kid, I forget his name. I said, just, I'm gonna go push the car, all you do is stop it and don't do nothing else. So I put him up, pushed the car, went around, he stopped it. I'm coming back down, he released the emergency brake, a car came around the curb, hit me, I went flying. That's over a tea kettle, can you swear? The free fall was the most awesomest ride. When I first went on that, I was scared at first, but then after a while, I got over it. I used to love the free fall. It was right next to the flume. I loved that ride. It was the best. The free fall, well, the free fall is basically a kind of a, G, a zero G type ride. It brought you up really quick, kind of brought you out. You had a good look over the bay, and then it would just sit there and, and make you wait before they dropped you. It's called the free fall. Only eight of them in the world. Free fall at Rocky Point. The Ferris wheel was one of my favorites, and the Skyliner. Anything with height that doesn't make you upside down, I'm game for. There was the Music Express. We could hear the music. I could still hear Donna Summer's music playing from there, because it was typically disco music that came from there. My mother had this fear of us going on the fer Ferris wheel. So the first time I went on the Ferris wheel, I had to do it without my mother knowing about it because she had had a dream that the Ferris wheel disconnected from whatever it's, and, and, and that it rolled into the bay. So she told us we could never go on the Ferris wheel. I don't think I told my mother I went on the Ferris wheel until I was in my 20s because I knew we weren't supposed to go on the Ferris wheel because she had that dream. 
they had Frank Sinatra Jr. there. And he was walking around like a sh** at his thing. And he had this skinny blonde with him. And he came over to the Ferris wheel, and I let him on. And I says, four tickets. And he says, oh, I don't have to pay. I said, what do you mean? I didn't like him, because I didn't like his attitude. Otherwise, I would have let him on. I said, I'm sorry, you got to have four tickets. I don't know you. He said, well, I'm, I'm Frank Sinatra Jr. I'm here for the weekend. I'm doing the, the show. I said, well, you still got to get a ticket. And he got all huffy and puffy. I said, you're going to have to leave my ride, and I threw him off the ride. <laughs> and I remember they had a rocket kind of ship, that uh, two, two things that looked like rockets that spun. I don't know why I even rode on them, but I remember used to get, I used to get a big kick out of it. I went to a Catholic school in Taunton, Mass., and it was the eighth grade trip. So, you know, in eighth grade, we're, we're starting to find out about cigarettes and other things. So, you know, the seventh graders were on their own bus. The eighth graders were the tough ones. And somebody had a pack of Marlboros. Got on the Skyliner, and we all lit up a cigarette in our little cars. And we're smoking on the Skyliner. We're very cool. We come down. We get off the ride. We're going down the ramp. And there's Sister Adrian, Sister Dorothy, and I don't know who else. But I remember the looks on their faces. They said, Empty your pockets. And they took the cigarettes from us, which was, at that point, we thought, all right, that's okay. At least you're not going to tell anybody. The worst part of that story is, later on that week, we're walking by the convent. We look in, and there's Sister Dorothy with a cigarette in her hand, smoking. And they were Marlboros. I guarantee you those were our cigarettes that they stole. The next best thing to writing this is writing this. Rocky Point Park. A lot of us, uh, when we talked about the coming, the rides at Rocky Point, uh, everybody agreed Rocky Point needed a really good roller coaster, and eventually they did. They got it. The only place that we had a footprint that would accommodate it would have been where the existing kidding land was, and that would have to spread out into what we had redeveloped as the petting zoo or the zoo. So we had to, had to take a good hard look at that, and then it came up with, okay, well, if we appropriate this land, what are we going to do with kidding land? So the next thing was figuring out a place for kidding land. Well, of course, there were, there were rides and equipment where we decided it would be the best place for kidding land, so we had to decide how we're going to move those rides and equipment. Uh, and this was in the year 1982, and we knew that we were going to look at a launch date of 1984. So it wasn't exactly like building the pyramids, but it took a little foresight. Corkscrew was custom-built for Rocky Point. You, there were already a few corkscrews out there, but there were not more than one or two corkscrews that also had a 360 loop in it. So ours, just for the record, was a loop corkscrew. So it gave you um, three 360 inversions rather than the usual two. And as you, as you will probably recall, as you rode the ride, and when you came into the first, when you came into the first helix, as they call it, it was a, 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 an egg-shaped 360-degree loop then you went on to some more track, and then you came into the actual corkscrew from where it derived its name. So we felt that that was very ambitious for a regional amusement park the size of Rocky Point. Do you know that this one right here mm -hmm. is not the Rocky Point coaster? It's not? Oh. It's a fraud. <laughs> and this sometimes happens. Rocky Point wanted to have a postcard, but I guess they hadn't made arrangements to have a photographer come and take shots, so they used a photo from, I think it's the corkscrew at um, Knott's Berry Farm in California. And the reason why I know this, Knott's Berry Farm started building, was one of the first parks that built a corkscrew coaster by the Arrow Manufacturing Company. And at that time, they had this decorative lattice work that supported the coaster. But the Rocky Point coaster never had this lattice work. I know, because I got my own slides to show it that way. So this, 
<laughs> this um, card is a fraud. And when I pointed it out to the lady at the concession stand where they had it on sale, uh, she said, nah, how dare you question our coaster? <laughs> I said, well, if you step out behind the lake and come look at it, it doesn't have a sticker. <laughs> um, the very last time I was there, I, my first date with my wife, uh, my girlfriend who would later become my wife, um, I took her on the corkscrew. And I had her, you know, convince her to get on the corkscrew. And then we did the corkscrew and I didn't, she got through it, and I said, I want to marry that girl. <laughs> My friends and I, we went to Rocky Point, oh God, at least, at least once a month, at least. And uh, we, um, of course, we met, always went to meet guys. <laughs> I was running the, running the Dodge car, the bumper cars, and it was, in the summer, it was really crowded all the time. And I mean, the kids were running from one, one ride to the other, and they, I mean, my line was always packed. I remember that day, I remember getting in line, and I remember me and three of my, three of my best friends. We, we always went together, all the time. Um, and he stopped me at the front of the line. And it turned out that I had let the people on and she was at the front of the line, and I happened to notice that she had a tube top on. And um, yes, I did have a yellow tube top on. They were in style at that time. And she had this one black hair on her. And he said, you have a black hair right there. And I was just like, I was so humiliated. It was just like so embarrassing. During my break, we talked and uh, she hung around there and we were talking and that, I, I can remember we talked about that. And then she would come and visit once in a while. And as I said, we went every month, but because of him, we started going a little bit more often. And I didn't know he was dating someone that, that, that um, worked at the park as well. And then we started dating and uh, Eventually we got married, had two kids. Now we have three grandkids. I was, uh, I was working, actually at the time I worked both in the uh, batting cage and at, in the food stands and I was at, I usually wasn't at stand one so we kind of feel like it's a little bit of fate. Cause I, used to, I usually worked at the pizza stand but for some reason that day uh, I was over at stand one and my, my best friend growing up, Brian Domenici, was there with me. Um, and we were both in, in stand one and I, I saw Sheila come in and I, I turned to my friend and I said uh, I'm gonna take care of training that one I'm, I'm all set and really the, uh, the rest is history well David and I were dating I don't know a few months at that point maybe or maybe was it a, well, maybe it was maybe a full that. year yeah. and well, I, uh, we give you I give you a promise right? yeah she did yeah. and I think that was the summer I was 13 and he was 14 and uh, his mom took us up to the park and we were on the midway and you want to take it over? <laughs> I, th I think my mom and grandmother made us take the, yeah. the picture. My grandmother was in tennis. Yeah. We were taking the picture. Um, she wanted us to go um, into the studio and take the picture under the wedding arch. It was kind of a joke, you know, the two teenagers under the wedding arch. Puppy and, love. Yeah. Seven years later, we did it for real. Rocky Point was a, uh, a staple stop on the political circuit. It was uh, a regular gathering spot for big events. Uh, there were two facilities adjoining. One was the Windjammer, which was pretty large, but then the Palladium uh, was huge. I remember having large events before election, and it was kind of incongruous because the place was in was in uh, uh, Warwick and I was running for mayor of Providence so we had to go to Warwick to find a place big enough in those days to host a uh, fundraiser or a party that would accommodate uh, the kinds of people that would attend, you know, the, the, the numbers of people that would attend. And I just have to say that I'm pleased to uh, visit the Rocky Point Palladium. <laughs> hey, listen, this is the first time I've been to an amusement park in years. In fact, I wanted to check out the corkscrew, but the Secret Service guys wouldn't let me do it. When President Bush uh, came to Rocky Point, that was in uh, late 1989, 
and uh, it was to tout the putative, putative Senate candidacy of Claudine Schneider. She was a popular congresswoman from Rhode Island, and the White House wanted her to run for the Senate. And indeed, uh, when 1990 came, she did run. And I assume the fix was in that she was going to run uh, or he wouldn't have come. It was uh, part of a spectacular day in Rhode Island politics because in addition to coming for her, the president was coming for Ed Dupreet, the uh, by then sort of tarnished uh, governor uh, who in 1990 would be seeking a fourth uh, two-year term. So thank you for inviting me to Rhode Island. God bless you, and God bless all of you, and God bless the United States. Thank you very, very much. As early as 1880, uh, Rocky Point began showing fireworks on the 4th of July. And this, this was a big thing for years and years. You want to see good fireworks, the place to go was Rocky Point. And they did a good fireworks display. It was, it was right over the water. You know, they, they put on a good time. And we'd anchor off of uh, Rocky Point for the fireworks and sit out there and watch all the fireworks. But one of the best parts about it was if you stood on the roof of the Cliff House, uh, where there was a walkway to go in the inside up there, you could see four different fireworks displays down Narragansett Bay, Newport, Bristol, Narragansett, Narragansett, and Jamestown, as well as the one we had at Rocky Point. It was just an unbelievable sight. They were supposed to go off at 11, then they say 11.30, then they went to 12, because they knew once the fireworks were really, everybody would screw. Somehow Rocky Point got a hold of these old buses that were going to be destroyed, and they just piled them up onto that big point at the end of what we used to call Sandy Beach, behind Rocky Point, behind the Palladium, where the bonfire would be held every year on July 4th. So they piled up, oh, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 buses, I, I don't, a lot. <laughs> and on July 4th, they just set a match to them. And this thing burned forever, it seemed. It burned for days. People were sitting on the seawall, just thinking this was an amazing sight to see, which it was. Of course, today you think about all the toxic waste and <laughs> the air pollution that it caused, but it was a spectacular Fourth of July fire. About 10 years ago, my wife and I decided to go to Rocky Point Park uh, to attend the auction kind of the last uh, chance that the public could get into the park legally so we decided to go and uh, looking around for souvenirs maybe take some pictures and whatnot and uh, kind of a melancholy day we're used to seeing the park full of people and there were very very few people there you could see like the seawall and the waves were crashing over the wall and the rain was coming down sideways it was just an a horrible day for an auction. It, it was sad. It really was. Uh, on the, from the auction company, it was just—it was very businesslike. You can tell that they do this every day. But the people who were bidding, a lot of people who were bidding on, and they were trying to get anything that had Rocky Point on it. And you can tell they were kind of like they just wanted a piece of that because they knew it was going to—they were going to miss it someday. This is in really bad shape because it did rain so hard the day of the auction. But it just had every, every ride. 
uh, that was going to be going off and exactly how many units there were of them. And it's amazing when you look at this how many things actually got auctioned off that day. I remember as the time grew closer for the auction to start, I just had this hope that maybe the auction would get called off and like there would be like a white knight that would come in. I think a lot of people hoped that. And it just didn't happen. The auctioneer came out and he didn't really walk around from ride to ride. He was on like a, a motorized platform and he just kind of drove from, you know, they started at one end of the park down near the cotton candy stand down near before the House of Horrors. And the House of Horrors was the first ride that got sold. And like once that got underway, like you just knew like, well, there's no turning back now. You know, it's really happening and it's going to be gone. It was disappointing to see the way it ended. And now to see it's all decayed and being torn down. Uh, everything that's being torn down is what my father built. <laughs>